around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to take the opportunity today to welcome you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's always a joy to be with you and to bring to you the word of the Most High God. Two very short announcements here at the beginning of the program today. We have mentioned numerous times about tithely, T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. That is a way, a means, a mode, a method that you can text an offering or a tithe to the ministry. And that number would be 1-828-600-5022. You would just text that and then the information will come up and you would just put in there give and the dollar amount and that will come to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. So for those of you who are very uh, sharp uh, with technology, uh, which I am not, but those of you who are and would like to expedite uh, your giving and helping us to carry the gospel of Christ around the world, you can just text at 828 600 And also, I wanted to remind you today that if you have any Alexa devices, you can now find the voice of evangelism there. Uh, Stephen and Jasmine have helped to expedite matters with the technology because I am way, way behind the eight ball, and they are helping us to get us uh, up to speed, up to par with what's transpiring in the world. So please uh, make note of those two things, all Alexa devices. So if you have one of those little devices, Alexa, play the Voice of Evangelism's last radio program, and she'll get that up for you, and you can start listening to it. And for that, we are very, very, very grateful and thankful. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Lankford. I'd like to make a very special announcement to you today. Beginning April the 5th through the 7th, 2019, we're going to be holding our first conference at Hickory Metro Convention Center in Hickory, North Carolina. Again, those dates are April the 5th through the 7th. Thursday, April the 4th, everyone will be registering Everyone will be moving in and getting their material together. But starting 9 a.m. Friday morning, April the 5th through the 7th, we're going to be having our first conference here in Hickory, North Carolina. The convention center is called Hickory Metro Convention Center. It's easy to find. It's right off of Interstate I-40. We're expecting a great, great time in the Lord Jesus Christ. Myself, Steve Quayle, Irvin Baxter, Hugo DeGaris, Russ Dizdar, the Hagmans, and others will be there ministering the Word of God and sharing with us uh, end-time events and technology and how things are increasing rapidly. So we want you to put this on your calendar. Please, we'd love for you to see you. We want you to come and visit with us and be with us. With all the close uh, interstates, we have Interstate I-40, Interstate I-77, Interstate I-26, and Interstate I-85. There is great accessibility. Hickory Metro Convention Center is right off of Interstate 40 in Hickory, North Carolina. The building will only seat 2,275 people, so I encourage you to go to our website and register as quickly as you can. Again, myself, Steve Quayle, Russ Dizdar, Hugo DeGaris, the Hagmans, uh, Jimmy D. Smith, and others will be there ministering the word. And of course, the people like Hugo DeGaris is going to be sharing about end time technology and how it's advancing rapidly. So please put this on your calendar and go to our website, www.thevoiceofevangelism.com and click on your ability to access the tickets. Now, the name of the conference is, the theme is going to be Age of Deception, Age of Deception. And needless to say, 
we are accelerating and the element of deception throughout America. So please put it on your calendar, April the 5th through the 7th. Of course, the registration will be on Thursday, April the 4th. Come be with us. I believe God will touch us immensely and powerfully. But more than that, you will leave encouraged and strengthened by the hand of God. So again, go to our website, www.thevoiceofevangelism.com. Click on for registration. And again, the conference will be entitled Age of Deception. Registration is $100. And some people say, why do you charge? It costs a lot of money to bring in the audio sound, the video equipment, to rent the building, and all the other things that go with a conference. So please understand, we'd love to do it for nothing, but it takes money to rent the building and the equipment and all the things that go into a conference. And believe you me, there is a lot that goes into having a conference. God bless you. Go to our website, register. I know God will touch your heart and your life at this convention. We're going to take today's program, this December the 11th on Tuesday, we're going to interject a a sermon message, and then starting next week, we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is one of the greatest prophetic chapters ever written and given to mankind. You will find in Matthew 24 a profuse, profound similarity That's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels in Mark chapter 13. Then you'll find a portion in Luke 17 and then another portion in Luke chapter 21. Some say that Luke 17, part of that and possibly part of Luke 21 was in the temple. And then when he came out of the temple and he sat down at the Mount of Olives, He began another discourse, however, tying these two subjects together, one while in the temple and then one after coming out of the temple. According to Matthew 25, he came out of the temple. He sat down at the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately saying, Lord, tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the word world there always means age. So we, we've been asking God to lead us what would be the next path that he wants us to elaborate on. And having been on radio now uh, internationally over 20 years, we've never taken on Matthew chapter 24. If I remember correctly, I exegeted that chapter uh, when I was pastoring in Charlotte. If I remember correctly, there's either 52 or 53 times the word and, A-N-D, is used in that one chapter. So it is a continuous conjunction of thus and thus and thus and thus and thus. And you'll see that as we get into it, how many times the word and is used in Matthew chapter 24. So starting next week, Monday, we will be elaborating and beginning Matthew chapter 24. It will take, no doubt, much time to exhaust the scriptures, and uh, I'll go ahead and give you a little heads up. Read Matthew chapter 24. When you see the rapture of the church, tell me. When you see the rapture of the church, email me, write me a letter, and say right here is where the rapture of the church is. And when you see that, look is what before it and after it. Don't take it out of context, but when you see the rapture of the church in Matthew 24, now I know my pundits immediately will say, but that's not written to the church. That's written to the Jewish people. If the Jewish people are blind and don't know who Jesus is, how are they going to recognize that? You can't have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. The truth is, the church was, that's why you hear the term Judeo-Christian values. The church was Jewish in its beginning. And then as God 
left the Jewish people and went out to the Gentiles, the Gentiles begin to come in. But then there'll be those who say, well, the whole chapter is written to the Jews. Well, quit preaching from it, please. If it's not applicable to the church, the body of Christ, quit preaching Matthew 24 and the signs of the times. Because you can't have it both ways. It's either applicable to us or it's not applicable to us. Yet there are those who adamantly would decree, declare, well, that's just for the Jews. Well, the truth is Jesus' disciples were Christian Jews, Messianic Jews. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So if it's written to the Jews and not the church, why do we preach it? It's because it is written to the church, the body of Christ. I want to take you today to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. I want you to listen to the plea of God, the appeal that God makes toward his people Israel. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. I just want to speak to you for just a few minutes on the old paths. The old paths. Without a doubt, this is an appeal from Jehovah to Israel to help them to avoid a great calamity. The Bible says in Proverb 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We're told in Proverb 1, 25, God said, you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. How many people today are sitting at the feet of God's counsel, but they count it as naught? They count it as nothing. You have sat at my counsel, and you would you would not listen to my counsel. We're told Psalms 1 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. God's people want godly, goodly counsel, and you can only get that from men or ministers who are preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Let me quote it again, Proverb 125. But ye have said at naught, all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Jehovah, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, is trying to forewarn the people of God of the calamity that is encroaching them. There's something about the old paths, the old way. Sometimes we use the phraseology here a lot, old school. I'm old school. And there's nothing wrong with old school. I like old things because I'm getting there myself. But you see, today the church has departed from the faith and gotten away from the old paths. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. You see, today we've substituted everything in the church for secularism. I've never seen so many versions of the Bible. What's wrong with the King James Version? What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what the problem is. You may not like it. You may not want to admit it. You may read a different version, and it may aggravate you that I say this. But the reason they keep rewriting the scriptures is so they can copyright it and make money from it. You can't copyright the King James and make money from it. So what do you do? 
You come along and you subtly begin to change things in the Word of God, and they are constantly removing and taking such things as the blood of the Lamb. They're removing words like the blood. Why? Too gruesome, too gory, too bloody. We don't want to hear about that bloody religion. We don't want that. We do not desire that. Make it palatable. Make it where it fits our modernistic lifestyle. No. No. Old is good. Malachi 3, 6, I'm the Lord and I change not. You can walk into many churches today, my friend. You don't even see altars in the house of God anymore. You don't even find altars in the house of God anymore. When I built both churches in my ministry, I didn't put the old-fashioned wooden altars in front of the church But I built the podium, the pulpit area, the platform, so that people could come up there and kneel and pray to serve two purposes. But I remember as a kid growing up, you walk into a church, and at the front of every church was wooden benches where people would come and kneel and pray. And you could go up and walk up to those old benches, and you could look at the wood. Those were the people who didn't have much money. They were just wooden benches types of benches, altars, and you could see all the, 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 the wood as it was stained, as it was discolored by the tears that had been shed on those altars. People that had a little bit of money and somewhat more refined, they would pad their altars so that when people would kneel and place their head on the altar, it was padded. But I remember the day when just old wooden altars, just, you know, boards, planks, and, and they would stain them and, and then maybe polyurethane them or put something on them to try to seal them. But you walked into a church, you knew what those benches up there were for. You knew why they were there. You knew it was a place to come and seek God. Look up the word altar. Look up the word altar in the Old Testament. It simply means a place to meet God. Every patriarch, Abraham, built an altar. Noah built an altar. Isaac built an altar. All godly men would build an altar. You see, an altar can be any place. You can have an altar in your home. It can be uh, the side of your bed. It can be a chair. It can be a sofa, an ottoman. It, 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 It can be any type of furniture where you come and you kneel and you prostrate yourself before God and you seek God from the altar. And the altar represents you putting your life down as a sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace of God given to me, to every man that is among you, that a man ought not think more highly of himself, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You are to present your body a living sacrifice. We don't even have altars in the house of God anymore. Not only do we not have altars, preachers don't make altar calls. Oh, that's an indictment. That subjects them to an element of guilt. We're all guilty. We're all sinners. But we need to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. When you become washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're no longer a sinner. Well, what if I go back into sin? Now you're a backslider. Now you're a hypocrite. Now you're two-timing. Now you're prostituting your relationship in Jehovah. You're only a sinner once. Once, if you get saved. After you get saved, and if you turn your back on God, and 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 I've come to loathe that doctrine, once saved, always saved. Why is the term backslider even in the word of God? Because that's what Christian people do when they turn their back on God. Back, you get it? Backslider? Turn your back on God? Do you get that? What's hard to understand about that? 
See, you turned your back and you walked away from God. God said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. It is men who abandon and forsake God. God does not forsake man. Man does that. We're all guilty. At one point in time, we have turned our back in some degree, and we've looked back at the past, and we've thought about the past, and we've reminisced the past, and some have gone back to their past like a dog has returned to his vomit or the sow that was washed to the wallowing in the mire. Man's propensity, man's proclivity is a, a degenerated one. We are degenerated human beings, whether we want to admit it or not. What makes us godly, what makes us good, what makes us righteous is the blood of Jesus Christ having been applied to our hearts. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. When I gave my heart to Jesus, when you gave your heart to Jesus, you became a new creation. You became a new creature. You became a child of God. You laid aside the weights. You laid aside the sins, and you said, I want to deny myself. I now want to take up my cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and deny himself daily. Daily. Every day, you must pick up your cross. You must deny yourself. The cross is the old path. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, faith. But he said, I am crucified with Christ. I have crucified, I have mortified my members. I've mortified the inordinate affections, the lust, the greed, the covetousness, whatever that it might be. I've nailed that to the cross of Christ. And I keep myself crucified. First Corinthians 2, 4, Paul said, First Corinthians 2, 2, 4, I've determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified crucified. Well, we don't like that word. You heard the term, boy, they crucified me. Not literally, not physically. It's a metaphor when they use it like that. Boy, they just crucified me. Or I, I, I'm in the crucible. I'm in the crucible. I mean, I'm going through a hard time. Carrying your cross is the old path. You're modern preachers today. I, I shouldn't even venerate them to the degree of being called preachers. They're not preachers. They don't know what it means to get lathered up like a horse and preach. Get all sweaty. Get all bent out of shape, preaching uncompromisingly. But they want to preach in such a palatable way that everyone will like them. And God's all the time saying, but I'm puking you out of my mouth. Some say that's not nice to say, Pastor. Well, I got it from Jesus. Okay? Puke. You say, is that in the Bible? Revelation 3, 15, 16. I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew the out of my mouth. Look up the word spew. Spew. Look it up. It's puke. Vomit. Hot vomit. How you like that? Is that gross enough for you? Hot vomit. Spewing out. Because God is going to expectorate those out of his church, out of his body, who are living in sin. Living in sin. How about the atheist woman the, in the Church of Canada, just the other day, the Church of Canada, I shared this on the Hagmans a while back. She's an atheist. They put together an ecclesiastical trial board. They tried her 
in a purported Christian denomination, and they exonerated her, let her keep her credentials as an ordained minister, and she says, I don't even believe there is a God. What's more sickening, what is more powerful than that? The church people, the church, the lay people, the parishioners said, we want to keep her. What does that tell you about that church? That church is on a quick sled to hell. That's right. They're on a quick sled to hell. That tells me people in there don't have any convictions. They don't know the word of God. Romans, uh, excuse me, Psalms 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So they got a fool in the pulpit. And that's who they want for their leader, their spiritual leader, the one to admonish them, to nurture them, to shepherd them, to love them, to serve them. You want a fool doing that for you? Surely there's somebody in that church smarter than that. But that's what happens when you apostatize and you depart from the faith. You depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some, not all, but some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as with the hot iron. Now that church where that lady purportedly pastors, that whole congregation are, is a congregation of apostates. They are a congregation of reprobates. They are so sullied. They are so soiled by the power of sin and Satan, they've lost their way. They need to get back in the old path one more time. You see, when he says here to Israel, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path, he's saying to them, I want you to uh, avert this, this calamity that's coming upon you. Great calamity, a calamitous event is coming on America. And men like myself and others are trying to preach to turn the people back to the old path. But no, you're out of date. You're out of style. You need to catch up with the times. The Bible's changed. That's a lie straight out of hell. The Bible hasn't changed. We've changed. We've changed the Bible. I've never seen so many acronyms. You know, we say KJV, King James Version. That's an acronym. Look at all the acronyms of the other kinds of Bible. And you say, well, you're wrong to bash that. I'm telling you it's a subtle betrayal of Satan himself to get you out of the old path and get you into a path that will take you straight to a devil's hell, amen. You see, there are those listening. They don't want to change. You don't want to change. Oh, you think about changing, but deep down in your heart, you're not really committed. You're not really sold out to God. You see, in the old path of righteousness, there's hope. The old path, God said to us in this scripture text, the old path, that's the good way. Am I misreading this? Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the path within the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? The old path is the good way. The new path is the bad way. That's right. Proverb 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Who would have ever thought we would be debating sodomy, same-sex marriage, abortion, and divorce in the house of God. Who ever thought we would be debating these things? But we are. We are. We're debating. We're contemplating. Let us ruminate. Let us ruminate this matter. Let us debate this matter. Let's meditate on this matter. Let's, let's, let's see where it will take us. It'll take you to hell, I'm telling you now, before you start thinking about it. How many times do you have to touch a, a hot iron 
before you realize because it's cherry red, it's hot. You see, people don't like you to make it cut and dry. They don't want you to make it black and white. They want everything gray. God does not allow grayness. God says it's black, it's white. It's evil, it's good. It's sweet, it's bitter. It's, it's either wickedness or righteousness. It's either heaven or hell. There is no middle ground, heaven or hell. There's no middle ground. There's no purgatory. It's either heaven or hell. Which one will you choose? The worldly path leads you to hell. The good path leads you to the kingdom of God. It's very simple. You see, the good path, the good way, it is the way that all the patriarchs have traveled. We're commanded stand in that good way or the good paths. You see, the path that you choose determines your destiny. I get so tired of hearing that word on, on Christian television, destiny, 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 destiny. Your destiny is very simple, heaven or hell, heaven or hell. That's your destiny. That's, 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 the, that's the end of man, heaven or hell. When you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. You say, well, I don't believe that. That's just too crass. You don't believe the Bible. The rich man in hell. He died, he went to hell. Lazarus died, he went to Abraham's bosom. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we now don't go to a place called paradise, we go to heaven to be with God. Prior to Christ's resurrection, men went to Abraham's bosom. Because the rich man in hell could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And Lazarus could not get to the rich man, and the rich man could not get to where Lazarus was. So it was either heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. You see, I don't like it when you talk like that. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. People don't like the truth today. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way, that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Let's go to Matthew 7, 21. That was Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Now let's go up to verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 26, 41 says clearly, Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not prepared for men. But if you choose to follow the devil, if you choose to live in sin, if you choose to spurn and to castigate and to reject the powerful conviction of the Holy Ghost, that will be your destiny in the time of the end. That, my friend, is where you will end up. And in hell, there's no mercy. In hell, there's no love. In hell, there's no forgiveness. There's no redemption. Even the love of God does not go beyond the portals of hell. God's love stops. One of the great tragedies of getting away from God and becoming a backslidden person and continuing to be religious, that's what calluses a man or a woman's heart, and they continue to live in sin, but they want to feign with their mouth and with their lips, but I still love Jesus. So Saturday night, you're going to the honky-tonk, going to find you a man, going to find you a woman, you're going to get boozed up, you're going to get liquored up, and you're going to go home with them or take them home with you, and you're going to commit fornication, and Sunday morning you're going to say, I still love you, Jesus. I know I messed up, but I still love you. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You, you can't have this your way. What if you died while you were fornicating? What if you died while you were drunk? You think you go to heaven drunk? You think you go to heaven fornicating? 
You think you go to heaven committing adultery? I don't think so. Because my Bible says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you think fornicating is unrighteousness? Don't you think getting drunk is unrighteousness? Don't you think committing adultery is unrighteousness? These are all sins, but you won't hear your little Joy Osteen's ever preach against sin. We're changing. We've gotten out of the old path, and we're making a new path. And they say, oh, this new path is better. Oh, this new path, it's great. Man, you can live in sin, still be a Christian. You can be a homosexual and be a Christian. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm a Christian drunk. I'm a Christian adulterer. I'm a Christian fornicator. I'm a Christian thief. I'm a Christian liar. Just because you put Christian in front of it doesn't change it whatsoever. You are what you are. Paul even decreed, I am what I am by the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, that's somebody that's redeemed. The other people are, are, are what they are because of Satan and sin. Sin. We don't like that word. You, you can listen to preachers for hours, and you'll never hear them mention the word sin. And, and this is why we don't ask for money. I loathe, I loathe those men and women that get on television and beg and beg and beg and beg and promise you the world if you'll send money to them. Get the prophet's r r prophecy and send this money in and you'll get something. You'll get something all right. You'll get a pig and a poke. When did the gospel begin to evolve around money? When? And the reason these charlatans, these pretenders, these shysters, these hucksters, the reason they stay in business is because people support it. They support it. The old path. The old path demands godly living if we walk in the right path or we walk in paths of righteousness we find rest and the psalmist said in psalms 23 4 he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake every one of us should be desirous to live and to walk in paths of righteousness, 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 not wickedness, not covetousness, not sinfulness. Live and walk in paths of righteousness. I want to share a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 28. You've heard me say this before. Deuteronomy chapter 28 has 68 Bible verses in it, 68. Only 14 of those verses speak of blessings. The other 54 verses speak of one thing, curses, 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 curses. Listen to the word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 64, 65, and 66. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night. Thou shalt have none assurance of thy life. You'll have no assurance. 
Not insurance, but assurance. You'll have no assurance of your life. Paul said, for me to live is what? Christ. For me to die is gain. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Think of what Paul just said. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Are you serving Christ? See, to live in Christ, you got to walk that old path. I said, you got to walk that old path. Philippians 1, 21 excuse me, 2021. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He says to Israel there in Deuteronomy 28, thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. Uncertainty will be your life. I knew as a backslider away from God, I'd go to bed at night drunk. I'm not going to lie and act like I was something that I was. I was a, a, the lowest of the lowest. Low, low, terribly low. And my life would hang in doubt before me all the time. Why? I knew I was one step away from eternity. One more car wreck. One more knife fight. One more gunfight, one more stupid step, and I knew I'd be out into eternity, and I knew I'd be lost without God. Don't tell me I wasn't saved, and don't tell me I didn't receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost when I was 12 years old. I know what God gave me. Don't try to slander my testimony when I knew I walked the walk and I talked the talk, but up, got, up in, got up into the high school years and teenage years and, and, and began to do stupid stuff like we all have done. But I knew my life was hanging before me, and I had doubt. Sure, I did. There were times I'd go to bed and say, oh, God, that's when I believed in the pre-tribulation rapture. Oh, God, don't come tonight. I know I'm going to hell. Some of you, you know, you relate, you relate to everything I'm saying today. You relate right to the T. Your life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night. People who live under tremendous perpetual conviction. You're always miserable. You're never happy. You're never satisfied. You're, you're, you live a life of misery. You can't run from God. Your life shall hang in doubt before thee. You'll have fear day and night and shall have none assurance, no assurance of your life. None. Is that not a terrible way to live? But see, that, that's where the devil wants you to live. No assurance. That old gospel song, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. God wants you to have assurance. He wants you to be firm in your faith. He wants you to be enduring. He wants you to trust. He wants you to believe. He is reliable. He is faithful. On him you can depend. You can depend on Christ when you, when you cannot depend on anyone else. You see, sin produces uncertainty. Sin produces uncertainty. Proverbs 27, 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You see, as a child of God, as a believer, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, I don't worry about dying. I'm not afraid of death. Because as Paul, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Death is a mere door. It's a mere portal that we go through to get to our eternal destiny. This is why this nation is in the throes of death. America is in the throes of death. The oxygen is almost out of the body. We're being choked out by sin. You say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Yes, sinful leaders destroy us. Sinful leaders cut off our spiritual sustenance because they say, you can't pray there. You can't do that there. You can't say that. 
Haven't you noticed if it's got anything to do with good or honesty or integrity or righteousness, they hate it? They hate it? Anything that's good, they hate it. Donald Trump, like I said, could walk on water and the news media would say, poor old Trump, he can't swim. That's what they'd say. Man can't swim. These people are evil because they've gotten out of the old path. They've created a new walk. They've created a new way. They've created a new path. And that path is not good. In that path, you will not find rest for your soul. In that path, it's not a path of righteousness. It is a path of destruction, a path of chaos. I love Psalms 119, verse 133. David said, order my steps in thy word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Man, have I prayed that Bible verse. Man, have I prayed that verse. Order my steps in thy word. Let no iniquity have dominion. The word dominion there in the Hebrew means authority or lordship. Don't let any of these things, Lord, have lordship over my life. Because to whoever you are brought into the bondage of, that is to whom you serve. Remember, Jesus there in Matthew 6, 24 said, No man can serve two masters. Romans 6, 12, let not sin therefore reign, have lordship, authority in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. When you start living by grace, you're freed from all sin. You're freed from all sin. You will either be obedient or you will be disobedient. This is this obedience or disobedience depends what kind of rest or unrest we have in our lives. If I'm obedient, I have rest. If I'm disobedient, I have unrest. Isaiah 118 says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord of hosts. If you will, if you will be, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the reward of the land. But if you rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the fruit of the land. But if you rebel, God said, if you rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. God's made provision. If you be willing and obedient, That's the provision. You shall eat the good of the land. You'll eat the fruit of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword. It's pretty clear cut scripturally. Romans 125, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Who are you serving? Who are you serving? You can't serve both of them. I pray today that those of you who are dabbling, you're playing in sin. You're doing things. You're watching things. You're going to places. Some Somebody listening today, you're even dabbling in an extramarital affair. You know what's wrong? You know it's wrong. The adrenaline flows when you try to make the contact. You try to set up the little tryst or the rendezvous. and Your palms are sweating and you're so nervous because you know in your heart you're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. It is wrong. 
God wants to stop you right now from your sin. And if you will let the Holy Spirit touch you and lead you and stop you, you will not fuss, you will not face shame and disgrace. But if you keep going down that path, you hear me, shame and disgrace will be all over you. You cannot, you cannot toy with God. God is not a man that he should be mocked. You should not scoff the conviction of God, but you should, with, with all of your heart, you should embrace God and let God touch you in this hour. Father, I know you're speaking to somebody's heart today who's dabbling in sin. They're toying with sin. They think it's a game. They think it's fun. But they don't see the disaster. They don't see the chaos. They don't see the mayhem of the end results. God smite their eyes that they might see as the noonday sun in its strength the reality, the reality of where they are. Satan is a deceiver. He is a manipulator. He, he tells people lies day in and day out. And after a while, they begin to believe them. They begin to believe them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the throes of hell, the fiery darts, the evil thoughts that he tries to pervade within the hearts and minds of your people. Give your people peace. Give your people rest. Give your people strength. Help every one of us to find the old path. Help us to find the old path because therein lies righteousness and the good way. Lord, we need the good way as never before. Father God, touch us. Touch us that we might be touched and that thy divine power and presence will change us and change us eternally. Father, we ask it today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I hope the Holy Spirit has touched you today. I hope he's ministered to you today. I hope he's spoken to you today and driven you back to the foot of the cross where your eyesight might be returned to you and you be made every bit whole. I do want to remind you of our conference. The actual conference dates are April the 5th through the 7th. That's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Registration will be on Thursday. You'll come into the convention center and you will register. I'm going to be there. Steve Quayle, Russ Dizdar, Irvin Baxter, Hugo DeGarris, Jimmy D. Smith, and Joe and Doug Hagman are going to be with us in this conference. The conference is going to be at the Hickory Metro Convention Center. Now, they've got a crazy address, but the address is 1960, 1960, 13th, 13th Avenue Drive, Southeast. That zip code is 28602. Again, that address is Hickory Metro Convention Center, 1960 13th Avenue Drive, Southeast, just SE, 28602. Go to our website and go to the conference. Click it on. You can register there. The registration is $100. Some people say, why do you charge? Well, go out and try to rent a building of that size. Rent the audio, the video, and all the amenities to put it all together, uh, security and everything. And you'll see, you'll see and understand why there has to be some kind of a fee. The power bill, the security, the audio, the video, the building, all of these things are an expense. And, of course, we are, 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 are ethical people, and we like to take care of the speakers, and we have to put them up in motels and feed them. You can't expect people to come for nothing. 
and to work for nothing. And we respect and we honor those greatly who are ministers or like the Hagmans who allow their platform to be used on a regular basis for the gospel of Christ. So when we ask you to to give $100 for the registration, we're doing that because it takes the funds to take care of everyone. And, of course, nobody comes uh, for nothing, and, and they don't set a, a number and say, you got to pay me this to be there. That's why it's called an honorarium. We honor them and their service. And so please, please put this on your calendar, April the 5th through the 7th. Uh, there are plenty, plenty motels around there. There are about seven or eight motels within walking distance, numerous restaurants. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time of uh, relaxation. It's a time of, of hearing and receiving from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you, and please register, and register as soon as you can, because if somebody starts saying, you know, why didn't you tell us it before it got sold out? Well, we're, we're doing that right now. We're telling you right now, uh, the building will only accommodate 2,275 people. And many of you can drive within three, four, five hours. So the expense is way down to drive. We have Interstate I-26, Interstate I-85, Interstate I-40, and Interstate I-77. And the Charlotte Airport is about 35 or 40 minutes from the convention center. So if you fly in, you're not that far from the convention center. Come and receive and be blessed and be a blessing. Amen. God wants to touch all of us and I want to strengthen your hand. And, and, and this will be a time of, of, a, a, a fellowship, a camp meeting revival. And of course, we're bringing in a couple of gentlemen like Hugo de Garris to show the church, the severity of the hour and how tenuous and how uncertain the world is because our world, my friend is changing greatly more and more each and every day. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Tomorrow's my wife's anniversary and mine too. So 37 years of marriage. God has been good to both of us. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502 Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.